Hello class. Uh, today we're going to be talking about um, uh, grammar of the edits and uh, we're going to be going over uh, chapters um, three, four, and five uh, in the fourth edition of the text. Now uh, this particular um, uh, chapter three in this edition, again edition four, covers sound. So that's what we're going to be starting with today. Okay? So let me get this ready. All right. So um, I'm sharing the screen with you so you can take a look at my notes. Um, so again, we're talking about sound in chapter three. Um, and uh, typically when we talk about sound in production, uh, let's say critically or as a theory, or um, let's say, what does sound do in production? Well, one, yes, it, it conveys sound. It conveys <laughs> uh, audio information. For many of you, um, these, this is really the only way that you uh, take in your information. And you're saying, well, what do you say sound over visuals? Because many of you don't watch. Uh, your shows, especially in, in the younger generations, you know, you have your device, you know, in front of your face. Um, you know, you're usually engaged with some sort of social media. Um, or you might even be watching a video as you have a video watching. How many of you have done that? Um, so sound is actually, uh, I believe in a way, taken a different form in the sense that before it used to be specifically tied or specifically to uh, take a backseat to the visuals and that audio was there for support. But I think interestingly enough, in the last few years, especially, um, especially with the, uh, um, the proliferation or let's say the advent of podcasts, because podcasts aren't anything new. I mean, they've been around uh, since the introduction of the iPod, right? Um, or in the mid nineties, I mean, I'm sorry, not the mid nineties, but mid two thousands. And um, um, that's what they were named for. Remember they were named for the iPod podcast. Uh, and uh, they were strictly audio uh, media. They were this. The, they took the same form. Typically, they were either someone you know, go, giving their own opinion. Uh, sometimes it was a show that was pre-recorded with video and audio, and they just give you the audio. But un uh, until the uh, you know the um, in 2007, when uh, iPhone was introduced, that changed everything, right? And video really went into high gear. So before. For the first section and in the introduction, sound was a psychological, physiological, emotional connection. Um, and, and that's what it was for. It was kind of there to reinforce the visuals and it was there to provide the emotion. But now it provides the content. Um, as we go through the rest of the chapter, I, I will kind of emphasize that. Um, and, and really remember, uh, early films up until 1927 um, were silent. Uh, and what that means is, um, there was the technology where we shot our in production. When we were in production and we were shooting, uh, we didn't quite have the technology yet to record audio at the same time and then to uh, sync it up. That's, that's really what we mean by silent. Um, later on, I mean, um, we did get uh, fil silent films with a type of sort of a, like a jazzy ragtime type of piano score attached to them. I myself had many uh, Charlie Chaplin films that were release that way on especially on VHS but uh, keep in mind that it was uh, uh, typically uh, audio was for the um, uh, uh, design to be the uh, uh, supplemental uh, information um, now sounds gathered during production dialogue this is what is said on the screen. Uh, this is what the uh, comes from the script these are the actors talking back and forth um, I put the word premeditation in there or premediation, which means um, th there's nothing really to think about. It's already written for you. You just sort of regurgitate what you have. Uh, sometimes uh, dialogue is a question and answer period. So if you've ever seen the interviews, that's what we mean by that. Um, it can be unscripted. Now, sometimes uh, you go watch a show where the, uh, it's called, it's the, the characters are improvising what's happening on the screen. A couple of shows that do that would be like Curb Your Enthusiasm. Um, that's probably, to me, that's one of the better ones that does it well. Um, or interviews, uh, those are also typically unscripted. Now, we also have monologues. Now, these are types of, of uh, dialogue or types of audio recorded from people. Um, a monologue is the long interrupted speech by a character from the script or the lone host or interviewee or character. Um, these can also be um, scripted or unscripted. They go either way. 
but it's just uh, that's what a monologue is. It's just a long interrupted speech by one character. Um, now, uh, if you're an audio person, you also uh, can do what's called room tone or gather room tone. Uh, it's also, it also goes by natural sound or nats or ambience. Um, now this is capturing the environment itself for use in the reality of, of the show or the film that you're working on or the environment of the production. So if you're in a hotel room, um, you're gathering that sound. So it also, uh, another sound for uh, production audio is also WALA, uh, W-A-L-A. These are murmur sounds made by the crowds. Um, now this is all instructed by the production team. Um, this comes, the, the term WALA comes from uh, radio, uh, where saying the word created the murmur sound. So uh, if you're in radio and you say you wanted to cr capture a crowd, you know, like maybe you wanted that in the background, then you would instruct your group of people to say walla, 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 walla. And, and the, all of them doing that would create a cacophony, right? Or like, a, like an orchestra or, you know, of sound uh, that uh, would appear to be a form of ambience or, you know, like group people talking. Room tone is where we, um, during production, we set up, right? We have our lights, our camera. Um, and what we do is we leave all that on the set. Um, and what we're doing then is we're recording the ambient sound to get a sense of the room itself that we're recording in. And this is especially if we're shooting not on a Hollywood set or on a sound lot, but in a, uh, um, let's say like a, uh, a found room or um, someone's uh, a hotel room, a real location. Um, now, doing the, this sound, ambient sound gives you a sense of the room itself. And this is used then as silence in post-production. Um, this is usually about uh, 30 seconds to five minutes that's recorded. The way we do this is the sound recorder, the mixer, that what they'll do is they'll announce, I'm doing room tone or room tone recorded. Room tone is being recorded um, or we're getting the natural sound. At that point, everyone in production is is silent is is uh that's that's what you say and everyone understands they don't talk uh they turn off their phones or they put them on silent um i mean preferably turn them off you if you have your phone on during production that's a no-no unless you're given permission so you everything is turned off and sometimes you'll have unnecessary production members as well you have them leave the set uh, because you're trying to record what would be silence in the reality of this world. This natural sound or NATS or ambient sound is the silence that then the post audio mixer will use when they're mixing the rest of the uh, audio to give it a fuller sound. And this is what becomes silent. So you put this on one of your lower layers in your product, in your editing suite. Um, and then you just, you know, you put that, those levels so that whenever you have silence, you will always kind of have that underlying, in a way it's a hiss, but you have the ambience of the room. So this is why when you're watching films and they drop to silence, you notice that it's different than when like, if those of you have been editing an iMovie, you'll know like, wow, whenever I stop cutting, I get like sound and then I cut and then it becomes, there's a noticeable difference in the sound. Now, two things are usually happening there. One is you, def you most definitely are not recording uh, natural sound because why would you? I mean, most people don't. I would say 99% of people don't. They're just shooting or, I mean, they don't know that that's how you do that. And part two is your sound mix is probably too high anyhow, and you have to learn how to mix properly. Um, we'll go over exactly what that means in the lab tech uh, demo. Um, now, we also have wild sounds. These are recorded by the boom operator. Now, the boom operator is the person who's holding what's called a boom pole. At the end of the boom pole is usually attached a microphone. The microphone is attached to the audio cable or stinger. That goes to the, your device that controls your recording on or off. Now that in our program, we use um, uh, different types of recorders. Um, ones that I use are the Zoom H5 at this moment uh, in 2020, <laughs> that's what I'm working on. Um, now those uh, audio Zoom recorders have different settings on them but that's where you press record on, record off. The boom operator doesn't, unless, depending on your budget, they don't always necessarily have to be responsible for that. Um, they're just holding up 
the pole that the microphone is attached to where you're recording the audio. But if, uh, but sometimes you're doing everything. You're doing the recording, you're doing the, uh, um, the audio, the microphone placement and holding the boom. Um, so it can get arduous. So, you know, you want to rest it on your back and, you know, get some help when necessary because holding something up for long takes is, that's an endurance. <laughs> um, so usually the boom operator is recording that wild sound though. And it's usually to capture uh, the sounds of some of certain objects um, or things that could be filmed or things that are going to be filmed or shown on screen and you want to get a sense of what they sound like. Um, or maybe you're using it as part of B-roll. Uh, some, you know, like a, if, if you're going to use it as a cutaway. Now we use all of this sound and this footage to enhance the reality of the particular show you're working on. Um, remember, it's, it's all for the purpose of, of the story itself and, and, and the uh, reality of the show. Not necessarily, uh, you know, reality of real life. I mean, we're not in the business of recreating real life. Um, our business is to create a form of reality that we're then producing, that we're then gonna tr introduce to people. You know, because Jurassic Park isn't real, that's a reality of that world. Fast and the Furious isn't real, it's a reality of that world, et cetera, et cetera. The Harry Potter's right, I mean, that gives you guys a good sense. That's not real, it's a reality of that world and all the sounds and the way uh, people engage, that's specific to that uh, universe. Now, another aspect of audio is soundtracks. Now, these are popular songs typically used as a marketing or to sell the film. Um, it's all in the selling of the show. So it's all the period marketing in the way that we have it or the way we use it today. Um, it's, uh, it's used to drum up excitement to make people, uh, you know, um, uh, interested in that particular show. Uh, it, it helps to pre-sell tickets especially in 2020 where we are now or hopefully going forward when theaters, um, when, and, uh, when Hollywood decides how it's going to continue um, uh, and, and how theater chains will continue to work. Um, these uh, now uh, you can buy, usually you can purchase these pop songs or they're repackaged with the art of the film. So again, it becomes a collectible. It's just a way for the audience members to be a part of that world. Um, we're not necessarily talking about the score or the symphony where you have a composer create uh, uh, that non-diegetic sound, uh, but this is the pop songs, uh, the three to four minute songs with words um, that uh, again, used to sell. Um, now this can be diegetic like radio. Now, what does that mean diegetic or non-diegetic? I've just used that term. Uh, the word diegetic is anything that exists in the universe and non-diegetic is anything that does not exist in the universe of the show itself. So it's not something that the uh, characters are hearing. Um, so that would be like the symphony. Um, and even pop songs, sometimes, you know, your character gets sad and then you hear whatever popular sad song uh, is, um, is in vogue. And um, again, it's not like your character is hearing that, it's just used to reinforce the emotional content. Now here's sounds gathered during post-production because everything before was sounds gathered during production, which is when we're filming. Now sounds gathered during post-production is anything gathered after we're filming. Um, these are typically uh, working on this are sound designers, sound editors, sound mixers. They're curating sounds for your particular production. Uh, now here are examples, narration or voiceover. This can be scripted, uh, it can be spontaneous. But uh, it's typically recorded in isolation. Uh, the narrator, sometimes you see them, sometimes you don't, sometimes they just tell you what's happening. Um, another form is ADR, or what we call automated, automatic, uh, goes by a couple words, uh, dialogue replacement, or uh, can also go by looping. This is the post audio recording of production mixed with ambience or room tone to help match the production also. Um, it also can go by additional dialogue recording. Think of this as anytime you're watching action scenes in, in big budget blockbuster B movies, like uh, every single superhero movie, uh, every Fast and Furious, every uh, Mission Impossible, just those big budget Transformer, that kind of thing. Um, they're typically recorded silent, I mean, in, in a way. I mean, you sometimes get the production audio, but that's just used as a marker. 
uh, so that when we take all that content back into our, um, our again, our editing suite, we merge the clips together and our audio uh, that we recorded or that we do as ADR, um, then we replace the existing production audio. So a, a typical example would be Captain America running and killing the aliens, like to say in the um, um, Infinity Wars or End Games or whatever. Um, now, you know, we're filming sometimes with a long lens, so he's 30 feet away. Again, and if explosions are going on, you're not having a camera right there. So um, you might record some audio, again, with a little camera, and you can even use that as a, uh, a temp or guide track. We'll bring in Captain America later, so I think that's Chris Evans. We bring him into the studio. After we're done with the editing, we show him the scene, and we say, okay, at that point, you say, um, I got your six or you know whatever Captain America would say. And, and the actor goes into the editing room, he has his headphones on, big old microphone, and just like you're recording a song, but instead he says, I got your six, and he matches the, you know, his character's lips. Um, and he might even hear what, how he sounded on the day, and he'll just try to replicate that, or at least use that as a way to get the timing right. I got your six. Maybe he's doing it that way, like I got your six, or you know, however he emotes it. Um, now, we also have ambience tonal tracks. These are pre-recorded clips that can help set the emotional feeling of place. Uh, it's not necessarily literal, but it's more about psychological connections. So the, this is especially used for mystery. If any of you have seen uh, Citizen Kane, the, sh the opening scenes of Citizen Kane uh, show the camera, um, you know, with this sort of uh, uh, dark ambient tonal sound that sounds like a mystery or horror movie when we enter uh, Charles Kane's home. Um, horror movies use this all the time. Like, you know, whenever you go into a place that could be evil, doo -doo, how many times have you heard those doo -doo, like a bass or something? Um, and again, it's there to help set your, uh, your psychological um, state of mind. That's really what it's for. And again, they're typically pre-recorded. Now we also have sound effects or spot effects. Uh, this is where we combine several audio sources, and this is audio mixing then. When we get several audio sources together, that's the mixing, when we combine them. Uh, now, they may not have a literal connection to the source itself, but these are used to create a sound that has more meaning than the literal source. So what's an, uh, what is an example of that? Um, one of my favorite examples, uh, there's two that I think of. Um, one is in the movie Jaws. Um, at the very end of Jaws, uh, when uh, the shark is uh, defeated, spoiler alert, <laughs> I'm sure you knew that happened. Uh, but once it, it happens and uh, the shark explodes, we see the shark floating down. And uh, what, what uh, they did in that movie, and I don't know if it was the editor, Vera, um, I forget her last name, but uh, she um, or somebody added also a what could be what is described typically when you hear the commentary as a dinosaur roar and uh, Spielberg explains that in his commentary that that sound was there to enhance the um, or the fact that these are old animals or prehistoric they're like dinosaurs and the explosion was sort of like the raw and then as it floats down it's just roaring and again it's also there it doesn't have a literal connection to the source but it has meaning and it also, uh, just like the, pre the previous point on ambience, it's a psychological connection itself. Um, the other one I think about too is in the film Raging Bull where Thelma Schumacher and uh, other sound people, uh, but Thelma Schumacher talks about it in her commentary on that film. When the boxing scenes are edited together uh, and it's especially when uh, Jake is fighting uh, Sugar Ray Robinson um, they edited in also animal sounds and screams. It also can be like an animal when Jake punches the, our, you know, our, our character, Raging Bull Jake LaMotta, when he punches the other character, it sounds like animals screaming. Again, to reinforce maybe uh, this sort of uh, very uh, animalistic nature of the character. I mean, he is the Raging Bull, so it reinforces that animalistic aspect of him. Foley effects. Now, these are named for Jack Foley. He pioneered this technique of, of creating sounds. Uh, again, remember, we're talking about post recordings. This is everything, this is after audio is recorded. Now, Foley artists will watch a projected image. So they'll watch the movie and they have all of these objects around them 
that that creates sounds not their phone but like tons of objects it's, it's a really neat job and i mean it's something that i think we should encourage more and more and what the foley artists will watch the scene and using all of the objects around them will like do you know create stompy sounds for like walking for animals walking um sometimes they'll they'll fill bags of sand and like punch the bag of sand for what uh, for what they interpret as maybe uh, punching in a fight scene um i've heard of uh different artists getting sticks and hitting meat also to replicate fighting scenes they'll break bones if things need to be crunched uh they'll put nails in buckets or, you know like when there's a crash or glass in a bucket so they they get imaginative and creative in the sound so and especially if you're watching a science fiction film remember everything had to be created um, so the animals, like like the Chewbacca animal or alien, uh, I know it's a combination of a dog, um, a grizzly bear or polar bear, uh, and a couple of other animals. Um, then we also have, um, you know, the laser swords or the guns. Um, those are created by like hitting wires and whatnot. And uh, again, all that had to be created. So that's what a Foley effect and named by Jack Foley. Um, and again, that's recorded. And you send that off to your sound mixer and sound editor, and they put that in the final track, the final tracks. Soundtracks. Um, now, again, going back to music, uh, these are just use of pop music. This is to help with the marketing. This is also happening in post. Then we have uh, stings or stingers. These are short pieces of music that are used to bridge sections of the uh, of films or you know your of your scene. Um, uh, usually, if it's um, uh, depending on how it's used, um, we can use these also to introduce uh, bumpers. Now, bumpers are anything that's a bridging content. Usually, it, maybe it's a spaceship as it flies away, or like when the character looks off, and then we get a little, like a little dun 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 dun. You know, that little music that plays. That's your stinger, and a bumper is anything that bridges content. It's again, that's typically used as a transition. They, they last seconds. I mean, we're talking about maybe three seconds, three to five seconds, not long at all. But it's those in-between parts that happen between the major scenes. And it's also typically when we see our master, for those of you who are still learning uh, some production terms, it's when we see the, the master shot. Um, the last aspect of uh, audio that's recorded is the score. Now, this is uh, uh, your original piece, typically of orchestrated music. Uh, that's commissioned via a conductor or a composer of some kind. Sometimes they're also the conductor. The conductor is the one who performs the piece of music. Um, these, this is usually uh, used to manipulate the emotions of your audience uh, or to signal repeating motifs. Uh, again, a motif is any, and is any piece of music or sound used to introduce characters or remind you of characters, um, uh, themes, actions, or scenarios. And uh, the score itself will be considered non-diegetic because it's not something that necessarily exists in the universe. Your characters can't hear that music. You know, Darth Vader, when he's flying, doesn't hear dun, 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 dun. He doesn't hear that. So just remember that's, that's considered non-diegetic, non-diegetic. All right. Audio terms that you may encounter. Um, sync sound. So this is, uh, we, talk, we use this all the time. We're referring to synchronous sound. Now, synchronous sound sources uh, recorded on set during production um, uh, that has a visible source. Um, now, this can usually be a re radio or a television. Um, when we have a dual system, uh, dual system recorders is, a rec is usually recording audio uh, to a separate device, like in my case, an H5 audio recorder. Um, or, and to like the camera, sometimes you do that, or you record directly to the hard drive that's we're also recording the video. Um, we use that so that we can sync it up later on in post. Um, now also that dual system recorder can send that audio uh, back to the uh, audio recording room where the actor is doing their ADR. Again, that's piped in through their headphone so they can use that for emotional response and also to be sure to match the lips uh, of, of their character on screen. So uh, dual system recorders are very, very useful. We also use slate sticks, right, the clapper boards, uh, to help with audio syncing. This provides production information, uh, but more importantly, the reason why it claps is because that's how we have our visual and audio reference. 
This allows us then, if you're the audio editor, when you see that and you, and then you're like, ah, there's my audio where it claps, you match that up and then you know that everything after will be in sync from the, you know, from the character speaking to the audio that's recorded, their lips will match. So then, and then of course in Premiere, we can then trim all that off and just get the part that's relevant or set our in and out point just to the parts that are necessary. Uh, you, which is typically just after the action or the actor or the first assistant director calls action. Let me get my words out. <laughs> calls action. So that's usually when we set, do our in and out. Uh, in terms of slate markers, we have two types. We have a head slate and a tail slate. Head slates are taken uh, at the very beginning. So we go, we, the person will walk up and they'll call it out. They'll be like, hey, uh, scene 24 AA, uh, scene 53, uh, take number, whatever that is, and then smack. And then the, act, the, the first assistant director or the director will call action. Um, a tail slate, this is usually what we do in documentary. Now, sometimes we do both. We'll do it at the beginning. And then, da, 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 da. and then again, we go through all our, our procedure and we call action and then the interview happens. And then at the end, we'll get the slate and what we do for the tail slate is we flip it over, it's upside down. And then we, boom, we, we smack it again because we, we don't know via documentary when we're gonna use the video and the audio that we're recording. Cause we might use maybe the very last part of that first interview will become the first part of the show or the first part of the film. It all depends on the documentary. So again, typically with documentary, the rules are, they're different. They're not as structured as they are with narrative storytelling. We must be flexible. We are flexible when we do documentary because we just don't know when we're going to use the content. Um, remember that clap sound is used to create that audio synchronization. Then we have um, well, another very important term that you'll encounter is MOS. So sometimes the director will, or the first AD, which is assistant director, will call out MOS or MOS, but usually it's MOS, or they'll say this is motor only sync, or we're going to mid out the sound. All of them are MOS. This, is, this tells the audio person, oh good, I don't have to record. It's to indicate the shot will not record audio. Um, uh, and that, uh, you know, we can sit this one out because they're going to do this silent. Maybe they know that it's just going to be Captain America running up, you know, a, a plane. So they know like, oh yeah, they're not saying anything. And if we do, maybe we'll just add a grunt or two here or there um, so that we don't have to worry about recording audio. Things to remember uh, when we're recording audio is um, we have to set the Hertz properly, which is 48 Hertz when we're do it, when we're using our audio settings in uh, Premiere, it's also important that we are set at 48 kilohertz or 48 hertz, excuse me, um, because the, uh, that 48 represents video to stay in sync. Sometimes you'll see 44.1, especially on our audio recorders, because our audio recorders can be used for both video and, uh, and uh, music. And uh, if we're going to record for like CD, that was what we used, that was the hertz. 44.1 was used for CD audio. 48 hertz was used for video or film. So um, if we record improperly, sometimes what will happen is your video and your audio will just go out of sync over time because they're at different hertz rates. Um, so if you've ever done a wedding and you notice by, you know, 30, 40 minutes into it, you're like, yeah, my video, and my audio got out of sync. That's why. It's because they're not at the same uh, rates uh, that they're recording at. So if you want to make sure that they stay in sync, it's 48 that you have to set your audio. And uh, you typically do that in your camera. Um, the audio recorder has also that feature. Just be sure you choose the right one. Um, now here's our in-depth uh, definition of diegetic and non-diegetic. For diegetic sounds, these are sounds, remember, generated by persons, things, or objects in the environment. This is meant to enhance the reality of the show. And this is, again, the reality of that, the version of reality of that show. This comes from the Greek word for diegesis which stands for recited story or uh, narration or narrated story. Um, when we do this diegetic sound though, we should always match the tone of the show, uh, whether it's diegetic or not, whether it exists in the universe or not. Uh, so again, it's important to uh, get that tune, that, that room tone um, or that ambient sound if we're doing that. Non-diegetic sounds, remember, are um, uh, sounds that uh, are nothing in the environment has the source for these sounds in that orchestra score. 
This is used typically for dramatic purpose and for usually uh, manipulation, uh, like emotional manipulation uh, to get you sad, to get you happy, to get you scared. Um, and examples of this are, are the use of the musical score, voiceover narration, um, sound design, right? Now here's our next point, sound design. This is when we combine sounds, musics, voices, all kinds of sources. This is really anything goes to create an audioscape of some kind or to create a, a soundscape of some kind. Again, to enhance the reality of the show itself. So if uh, sound design, I mean, you might have uh, these weird sounds coming from all over the place, especially in horror movies. Doesn't necessarily mean that the character hears it or that something in that universe is making it. But it's there again to put you in that psychological, the proper psychological state of mind. They can be very experimental and the psychological expense uh, experienced by characters on screen. Remember, this is used to connect the audience uh, to the characters. This is, you know, for them to say, okay, I'm, you're scared and I'm scared, like in a horror movie. That's what we're doing. We're trying to create these connections and to put you in the proper state of mind. Now, sound motifs, I uh, mentioned that earlier, uh, this comes from opera, where certain sounds uh, relate to characters and events, and these are repeated to create associations between, uh, for the characters um, or the events and the sound in the mind of the audience. So when you hear these sounds, it creates certain expectation. Because it creates a certain expectation, um, as, as the director uh, further, uh, finishes the, the final video and audio mix or the editing, um, we can use then um, audio motifs or the sound motifs then to either uh, continue certain expectations uh, in the world itself. So an example would be those of you who have seen uh, Do the Right Thing. Uh, Radio Rahim, the character, carries around a boombox and listens to Fight the Power of the Public Enemy. And at any time we hear that music, we're going to expect to see Radio Rahim. Now, sometimes... Uh, we play with that and we'll, the audio will be there to um, distract us or to create a certain expectation and the director doesn't follow through. Now, sometimes that can be a bit of a cheat. A great use of, of uh, this motif is the movie Jaws. We always use Jaws as an example because John Williams uses it properly and he doesn't cheat the audience. We only hear this certain dun 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 music in Jaws when the shark is gonna happen. So uh, there are certain moments in the movie when we have a red herring or a distraction tactic by the production team. Um, but uh, we should know that that wasn't real because the audio motif wasn't used. When the actual shark attack happens, then we hear the audio motif. So it's, uh, Jaws is a really great study. So I would say, go watch Jaws and think about the way the audio is used in that. That is one of the best examples actually of, of sound in a film. And, uh, and if you watch it, remember, it's homework. <laughs> so I uh, highly recommend it for you all. So that's chapter three on sound. And uh, let's continue uh, with chapter four. Now, this one's going to be a little bit longer. And we're going to be talking uh, chapter four um, back to aspects of production and um, what works, and this is gonna be again more holistic. So audio is very specific to that part of, of editing, but now we're gonna be talking about sort of overall production. So this is about selecting the best shots and criteria to consider or things to consider uh, when we're choosing the shots that we're gonna use for our show. Again, because uh, the reason why we do this is sometimes um, uh, we're gonna get multiple takes of a shot and the editor can decide which one they want to use. Or sometimes we'll have the um, uh, assistant editor, you know, the editor will be like, okay, they, they've chosen their best one, but give me one or two options. So I can, you know, sometimes editors like to, you know, we like to mix a little bit. It all depends on how much time we have. <laughs> um, so aspects of um, things to criteria to consider or, or uh, things to consider for the show. We'll start off with quality assessment. So number one, is the shot in focus? So is the correct object or the subject or the actor correctly appearing in the frame as they do naturally in the world? In other words, are they in focus? And that's what we mean by focus. 
the definition of focus is objects as they appear naturally or objects as we see them in nature. Um, an object should only be blurry if it's in the service of the story. Uh, one of the, a great example um, that, uh, about focus that I've seen recently is in the film Still Alice starring Julianne Moore. Um, they use that very, very effectively as a way to show when a character gets isolated um, or confused due to a mental condition or dementia or Alzheimer's, but it's very, very, very well done. Um, um, now, another one is audio level. So again, criteria, all content must be good quality. So we listen for the audio levels, make sure that the volume is not too loud, not too quiet. Um, presence, does the audio recording match the perceived image size? So what does that mean? It's about perception. So if we have a giant object going, ah, you coming at you, then you expect it to be a little louder. That's the presence. If someone starts to whisper, then we expect the volume to go down just a little bit. I mean, we still want to be able to hear it, but we need to understand that the characters are, are, are engaged in an intimate moments usually. And, and that's also what it does. See, the perception creates these psychological um, reactions in the viewer. So again, that's what presence is. How is that, that psychological manipulation? If the, if the thing is big and boisterous, like a dog barking, then the audio must be that way as well. Hiss. Is there any background or electronic hiss or buzzing? Sometimes, uh, depending on an environment with a lot of electronic devices, uh, we get these, uh, let me turn on the slide to see if that helps me. We get, um, um, let me fix this real quick. Let's see if that helps for my lighting here. <laughs> we might get a, a, a form of, um, of electronic interference. Uh, now, uh, sometimes that's low battery as well. So change out your batteries. Uh, sometimes that's because the cable is kinked or again, wrapped up badly. Um, someone has their phone on, um, we're too close to uh, a cordless phone, television screen, electronics, uh, again, is its own thing. That's why it's a very important uh, job on, on set. So we just have to make sure there isn't. There are some tools that we can use in Audition in Premiere Pro that can help reduce some of that sound. But uh, again, it's not always, we don't want to rely on that. Overlap. Do we, do we have actors sometimes speaking over each other? Now, sometimes that's used as a technique. Um, the, uh, the filmmaker, John Cassavetes, was well known for creating overlap. Um, he borrowed that technique mostly from Orson Welles. These are people that were used to working in theater. And for them, when we have multiple characters talking and talking over each other, that creates a sense of, of, uh, of realism, again, in the reality of the show. All aspects or all intentional if that is what we're going for. Now we also have ambience. Uh, we do that again to create theme or create a, um, a, a type of, uh, of um, um, feeling or a theme for the, the show. But it, there's also ambience pollution. Sometimes existing noise pollution is recorded from the environment and that can be traffic, that can be uh, maybe construction, airplane, pollution or, or sound pollution or, you know, crossing overhead, helicopters, um, other crowd murmur. So we have to be just aware of that. So when we're recording, we want to make sure we have our headphones or cans on our head, you know, make sure that not everything's being recorded. And another aspect, I love this last point. Does it exist? Make sure that the audio is being recorded. All batteries are fresh and the recorders are turned on and recording. So we need to have an audio file to be able to, scrutinize it. So make sure if you're the audio mixer or you you know, even if you're the person doing camera and audio that you've hit record, you see the little lights going and you see the, uh, um, the uh, audio, um, the levels going up and down. I mean, very, very important. So be sure if you have the ability to have a audio uh, light indicator, be sure you have set that to turn on. I mean, it's just, I've done that before. Sometimes you record, Excellent taste, you're like, I wasn't recording audio. So you have to use either the existing audio or do it again. So uh, next section, sometimes looping or the ADR, which is again, that automated dialogue replacement. Um, it can be used to re-record sections uh, if necessary of, of certain audio sections. Um, so keep that in mind. 
that um, sometimes, uh, like I said, you don't record the audio, you forget. Well, uh, depending if you have time, you might be able to get your actor and just record the audio then and there. So it all depends. And again, you'll have to have quiet room, you know, just make sure that your environment matches the environment you're recording in. Um, exposure and color temperature. So now we're going on to continue more criteria. Are the images recorded with good exposure and the proper look overall of the, pro of the project's visual design? Um, now that, that uh, was typically more in film because we, uh, film wasn't as forgiving. Digital fires are a bit more forgiving, but we still, my, our philosophy at Valley, I think for most of, the, most of us that are in production, we try to capture either way the best images possible. And even in cinematography, I mean, we, we wanna talk about making sure that the quality or our, our images as close to final as possible. Um, but we keep in mind also, luminance and chrominance. Luminance, is the, the white level, the brightness and the contrast. So what is the white level? What is the light that's being recorded? That's, that's really it. And chrominance is color or hue and saturation. Uh, so we wanna make sure that the colors are pretty good. Now they can be fixed in post, but like I said, we don't wanna rely on that. And sometimes even the fixing in post isn't what we want. So just good technique is good technique. And I also wanted to show you my mug today. Um, some of you might see like, wait a minute, that sounds familiar. Black Mesa, this is a video game reference for those of you who have played Half-Life. This is what I consider the best um, science fiction story currently being told right now in any medium. But, um, and uh, Half-Life Alex just got released. So those of you who got to play it, lucky I'm jealous. Um, let's continue. Uh, so now we talk about framing and composition. So framing and composition. We'll also throw in there um, blocking, but we're gonna talk about screen direction, which is blocking. So uh, we wanna keep the format dimensions of, of our show or project consistent. So if we're shooting as a rectangle, like more of a square, I mean, 16 by nine and four three are both rectangles, but um, again, four three is more of a square, 16 by nine is you know, more uneven rectangle. Um, which is usually 4.3 or 16.9. Um, we want to consider headroom. So that's our distance from the top of our head to the top of the, of the composition or the, the top line. Um, look room. So if, and this is all related to the rule of thirds. So this would be one, two lines here, and we get one, two, three, and then two lines here, which is, creates one, two, three. And we usually want to put our eyes on that third line. So again, for those of you that are learning production, put, put lines on those, and put, put our people on those rules, on those lines there, uh, especially when they're engaged in um, a dialogue. I'm shooting head on because I'm not engaged in a dialogue with anybody else, it's just me. Uh, so you wanna put headroom. And so again, we wanna put one on one rule of third and then we have all this space. Um, and also camera angles, you know, we wanna make sure our camera angles are good. Screen direction is also blocking, which is movement from one side of the frame to the other in a manner that is consistent with perceived motion. So I added this particular image from the book. So if your character is moving from right to left, we can have a pause and then we can have our next scene with our next character, but we wanna make sure they enter right to left to be consistent. This, these are all aspects of continuity, okay? Continuity, so keep that in mind as well. Um, this goes back to continuity editing uh, the first major film to do this well was uh, uh, Edwin Porter's um, The Great Train Robbery. Uh, feel free to look that film up, The Great Train Robbery. It's only about 13, 14 minutes. Um, silent, black and white. But that was the first time audiences really understood like, oh, the action can continue. And if, if the scene cuts and the scene cuts and the scene cuts, this is the same character going through the same action as before. Because before when, see, when uh, uh, the entire action, the entire moment would happen in one, one shot, that was Melier, um, the most famous example is a trip to the moon. And whenever they would go off the screen, that would be a whole nother period of time, sometimes the next day. Uh, so uh, con screen continuity um, uh, allowed the audience members uh, and the filmmakers to continue the story in that moment off screen 
as long as they edit it properly and audience members can follow that. So keep that in mind. If we're editing, we want to make sure screen direction is consistent. The big name of the game for editing, um, especially when you're starting off, is consistency. Do your best to be consistent. Keep that in mind. Consistency, consistency, consistency. Um, 180 degree rule or the axis of action. This is one, again, another very, uh, can be typically difficult for uh, students to comprehend. Um, they break this rule all the time and cinematography and direction. And usually I draw it out, but the, what I draw out is exactly this first image here, um, which is a line and a, a half circle. And this half circle here um, I hope you can see my, my um, cursor, is where uh, the axis of, of action is happening right here. We'd never cross this line, okay? And notice when we see uh, the rest of the shots here, especially on the two shot, again, and both, both actors are on that one, one rule, one line of the rule of thirds, and she's on the other line of the rule of thirds. And notice then, that he's on the left side and she's on the right side. So that continues. And that's what we want the audience members to see. This is something that we take for granted and we just sort of assume it's like, oh yeah, we just, we know they go back and forth. But it's a, it's a technique that we have to follow and we have to make sure we never cross this line here. Um, and it takes practice because oftentimes, uh, again, amateur or, um, uh, filmmakers that are starting off, you break, they break this rule all the time. I see it every semester. <laughs> Always break the rule. And, and we do this so that we can have a good dialogue back and forth, back and forth. And we can cut back and forth between the two. He stays on the left, she stays on the right. Spatial continuity. Your audience, my audience understands that. If we break across this line here and we go over it, then what happens is your actors are on the same side. See, now she used to be on, she's on the right side, the right side. If we cross over there and shoot her from this side, she then, when we're editing though, is also on the left side as, as the male actor here. And that makes no spatial sense, right? I mean, it becomes confusing because then your actors are like, wait a minute, um, they're on the wrong side. Uh, and and uh, we don't want to, you know, again, we don't want to do that. Uh, we, we want to make sure our audience understands where our characters are and that they're engaged in a dialogue back and forth. The only time we can uh, break away or, and reset the camera is if we cut away to a neutral shot that doesn't have any reference to the other two characters. And that happens all the time in action movies. We cut away to something else. Maybe they look at something, we cut to what they look at, and then we go back to the actors. Then we can, we reset at that point. Every time we come back from a cutaway that doesn't feature the two characters as they were initially set up, this line of action then gets reset every time there's a cutaway, but only if there's a cutaway. Remember, a cutaway is something that does not involve our, our, our actors engaged in the dialogue. Then we also have something called the 30 degree rule. This follows our 180 degree rule. So again, to remind you all, this is the axis of action. So if some of you are confused, the axis of action is a straight line that's across, that's cutting across the heads of the two actors here. And then we have a camera that's placed every 30 degrees on that half circle. What that means then is every time there's a 30 degree movement of the camera, that necessitates a new setup. A setup is any time we have to set up, we put the camera up, we adjust the focal length and the lenses, we can sometimes change out our, our uh, lens itself, but we have to adjust the lens, we adjust the lights, and we adjust the sound equipment. And sometimes we even have to make concessions for the background. So keep in mind, that's the 30 degree rule. That's every time we move the camera at least 30 degrees from one placement to another, because that means we have to set up, we have to redo the shot. Um, let's see. So this is again, following the 180 degree rule, it states that the camera while moving in the 180 degree arc must be moved by at least 30 degrees before a new setup occurs. And making sure that the two shots are sufficiently different enough in the angle of action. So again, those are the angles uh, that will keep the audience thinking a jump cut will occur. I mean, and that's what it's doing. It's making sure that the two shots are different enough 
in the angle of action so that the audience doesn't think a jump cut. A jump cut is anytime we cut and that it looks like the heads change, but we're, we're still in the same shot. We see this all the time in YouTube. Um, this was a, a technique first really, um, let's say perfected by the French new wave um, and, and did have a purpose. It was meant to uh, bring attention to itself to the editing. But now YouTubers just cut, cut, cut. And uh, uh, documentary filmmakers, we used to use that technique um, as just as a way to continue sort of the consistency of our shot as part of this 30 degree rule. But now um, YouTubers do it so much that to me it's distracting. I can't watch several YouTubers for that reason. Their editing is horrible. And all that is is lazy writing. They shouldn't do that. They should just have their script written out from the beginning or use cutaways to hide those. So there are ways to use that, those techniques properly. Um, matching angles. These are, this is to make sure that we have coverage of each character in each uh, shot type where the angle on the person, his or her size in the frame, the lighting scheme and the focus on the faces are all consistent with each other. So we need to make sure that if we're doing these cutaways, we don't move the camera, we don't bump the camera, we don't shift it. We have to make sure that if we're cutting back and forth, especially on those dialogue scenes, that they match from one to the next. Um, now, typically the way we do that is we do setups where we have a camera, we run the whole scene from one angle. We do all of it, the dialogue and the, the, uh, the one actor and the response from the other actor. We do it once, take, do as many takes as possible till we get that one, the one coverage of that one actor uh, complete. Then we do a new setup and we get on the other side. So then we, let's say we go back and we get on the other side over here. Let's say camera A, we do that as many times as necessary. And we do the same thing with camera B as many times as necessary. Uh, and then in post, we take those, those clips over and then we cut them up so that it looks like they're engaged in a dialogue. We just have to make sure that they're matching. So here's a basic edit of an outside in construction. So outside in meaning mass Hollywood master sequence. We establish a shot showing the environment. That's our master shot. Typically a wide shot. Maybe we show the characters. Remember master. Then we close in on a two shot showing the characters in a tighter frame, that becomes our medium. Once we do our master, our medium, then we get into our close-ups, right? Then we do our first over the shoulder of the first character. Then we do the other over the shoulder where our second character answers our first character. Then we sometimes cut back to a medium close-up of the first character. Then we get the answering of medium of the second character. And sometimes we can end on that. So this is exactly the same sequence as we did in project one as an idea. Um, we start with the master, medium, close-up, 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 medium responses, done. Okay. So again, this is a standard repetition of the master sequencing. Uh, we want to make sure that we're matching the eye line between our characters. This connects the actors with each other and whatever they're looking at. We must have, and again, that's what establishes, make sure that we know that's what they're talking, they're talking to each other. We have continuity of action. The edit that matches action or continues the action performed by the actor in more than one shot. The frames can become very, very important. Remember, we just have to make sure if uh, someone is moving through a door, then we continue that. Sometimes we can cut ahead. So sometimes we have characters, you know, they enter a building and then they, we cut them entering like their apartment. We don't have to necessarily see them going all up. We get it, but we have to make sure that if they're moving in one direction, they continue in that direction, just like I showed you. Continuity of dialogue. Be aware of what is spoken from one take to, to another from, or from take to take, and that it's all at the service of the script. So if they're talking and we're cutting, they continue. We can change that up a little bit. Uh, Citizen Cage has really great examples of, when, of, of using like Merry Christmas and Happy New Year as a way to jump forward in time. What they do consistent though, is they keep, remember the, I talked about like uh, uh, tone or uh, audio level. And it works because the level is the same. When they say Merry Christmas and Happy New Year, we do jump forward about five years, but the volume stays the same, which is why that works. And it's a really, really great technique. Do a Google search of that uh, if you were curious about seeing it. Performance. Although the performance has been recorded, the editor may still manipulate timing, pacing, uh, juxtaposition with other scenes. Uh, we do that uh, to help change like tone, you know, like our mood, 
uh, like, you know, the feeling of what's happening. Sometimes we do that to change the character. Again, all back at the service of the script. Um, uh, we, remember, we can, as editors, manipulate all this stuff, which is why I always say we may have like a preferred cut uh, or preferred take by the director. But I always say, you know, as a, if, you know, as editors, sometimes we look at the other ones though, because there might be something in there that we can help to spice it up or you know, help with the mood. And last, uh, definitely not least, we want to make sure we're familiar with all the footage. Um, now, what in this sense, because knowing what footage is good to use will help in the editing uh, in case emergencies come up and you need options. Um, knowing all the blocks available to you or knowing how you know, the setups work and uh, the performances, this helps you build a better uh, film. Um, this is, it's, it's good to have those options. Again, this is why I, I always say, you know, if, if you're only selecting maybe one take, give yourself, you know, more options because you never know. Uh, the director might like another one. It's just one of those things that can happen. You might be set on one, but once you see the other one, you're like, you know what, it helps. You, it, the reason why that happens is when you're in production, you're so ingrained in your work that you have blinders to sometimes something that you might have missed. So it does help to uh, have alternate takes. All right, so that's the end of chapter two. Let's take a look at chapter five. This will be the last chapter we go over today. So we're gonna continue talking about uh, production and cutting. Um, here, we're, gonna, we're going to now get a little bit more specific on uh, some of the aspects of continuity, like, and, or when to cut and why. Um, and uh, so that can also be, you know, as the scene plays out, sometimes our instinct is, well, we need to cut, you know, uh, especially in, in, in current Generation Z, uh, because the attention span has gotten much, much shorter. I mean, we're, I think, three seconds, four seconds in terms of attention spans, uh, where before we used to be up to seven to 10 seconds. Um, but sometimes we want the scene to play out, you know. Uh, Tarantino films are good that, in that they do uh, let the scenes play out typically. Um, so keep in mind that uh, uh, every show will be different. Sometimes you'll develop a style of editing where you do cut more or cut less. But again, it doesn't always uh, ring true to everything you work on. So to point number one, we have to know our audience. Who is the film for? If we're, if we're making a Fast and Furious, there's going to be a lot of cuts. If we're doing um, a uh, Terrence Malick film or a Cuaron or Iñárritu film like Roma or The Revenant, we know the cuts are going to be a little, they're going to be fewer. There, you know, there's going to be an emphasis on the scenes themselves and their mise-en-scene. Remember the mise-en-scene uh, as a reminder, or if some of you don't know what that is, but mise-en-scene is everything inside of the frame, everything. Uh, so that's the actors, the uh, costumes, the makeup, everything, the sets, objects. Um, so keep in mind that the mise-en-scene, uh, sometimes we want to let that play out. Sometimes we want to cut sooner. Every show is a brand new grammar. And, and there is a grammar to editing. And remember, this has been practiced for a um, 100 years easily. Uh, just keep in mind then that every show... Um, will be different and the great editors, it is their job to um, uh, help the audience understand what the grammar will be of this show um, as they get into it. So factors that lead to an edit. We want to think about information. Inf uh, new shots always give us new information. It signals this is new. So questions to consider in terms of what is new. What would the audience what do we think the audience would like to see next in terms of what's happening in the show? Then we also think in terms of the script. Now, should the audience see this next? So, or what should the audience see next? Um, again, if we're doing like a, a thriller, horror, or something that's meant to give suspense, um, sometimes we have the, the, you know, we think about what can't the audience see next. You know, we're like, well, we want to show them this, but we don't want to show them this because we don't want to give certain things away. So you have to think ahead. Um, and also as an editor, what do I wish 
for the audience to see next? That's always very good. Like what, what do I, what do I hope or what do I think they should see? Um, you know, it, cause again, it helps with that. It can help with the uh, suspense building. Are the next scenes emotional? Are they meant to like make us feel a certain way or are they intellectual? Are they, make, are they, are they for us to think a certain way? Either way, if the, if the audience, if we have them thinking or feeling, then they're engaged. Um, you know, it's, it's something that we want. We want to make sure that our audience members are always engaged in one way. So here's an example. Let's think about motivation. If we're thinking about cutting something, what is the reason for leaving our previous shot? What's a good reason? Um, you know, maybe uh, we need, again, the new information. When is a good time to leave the current shot? Um, do we have a visual, oral, or temporal motivation? You know, is it something that we see here or maybe it's time to cut? Again, maybe we've been playing too long and, and we're thinking like, okay, it's, this is one of those action movies and we need to move on. So let's talk about then visually. If we're looking at these scenes, um, the motivator is usually movement of some kind by an actor or object in the mise-en-scene, remember the frame, everything inside of the frame. If an actor looks at something, the instinct then is to show what they're looking at. So if I, if I, if uh, like, let's look at this here. If uh, the person in the front, in the trench coat is looking at a name, then we cut to the name, what they're looking at. However, maybe we can choose, we choose not to show the information, um, which is also a choice to make. It, it can continue the story. How many times have we seen a show where the character looks at something and, <gasps> or, oh, and then we don't see what they see. This leaves a scene in a cliffhanger. Um, we just have to remember that we will need to show what they, they saw either later on, and it'll probably be a, a flashback, or in the next episode of the show. We just have to remember we're going to include that. If we're talking about audio then, as a motivation, something in the frame typically or the mise-en-scene is giving us information. Now that typically, if it's audio, it means it's gonna signal attention to itself. Um, like the, uh, in this case, we have the example of the tea kettle going off in a medium long shot or MLS, right, medium long. Um, now, depending on how loud that kettle can be, um, we, we apply then something that we call the rule of Hitchcock. Uh, which is this, the object in the frame that is the most important should be the largest object, which is, again, that idea of close-up. So uh, in this case, um, if, if, uh, if the kettle is going to be very important, then the kettle should be very large in a sense, or the size of the kettle should be reinforced. Uh, this helps uh, as part of that motivation and reminds us that this is going to be loud or it should be loud. The bigger something is, usually the louder it is. The smaller it is, the quieter it is. That's, you know, like, or the idea that something's far away, something close up. We can also use audio as a sound bridge. Um, this is a technique where the audio, the editor lets the audience hear the sound, but sometimes delays the reveal as a way to introduce a source of the audio, uh, which may not always be the exact source, but can be either something similar or it can be something visually interesting. Um, so we have examples here of like the uh, someone waiting outside. Um, then we hear maybe a train and then they look out and then we cut to the train itself. Um, we, we call that a J cut or an L cut. It depends which way the audio goes, but um, just like the letter J, right? If we, if we think about the J, then we say, here's a cut, but the J goes on. That means that the other clip can continue. The new audio kicks in for a minute. And then when we get to this, that upper stem part of the J, that's where the next video part comes in. But we've already been hearing that audio. Um, now, again, that can be used as a joke. Uh, one of the best examples is in uh, Jurassic Park, The Lost World. Look at the very beginning of that. Uh, we see a lady who's about to scream. And as she's about to scream, it sounds like a, um, uh, a train whistle. And then we're cut to uh, Jeff Goldblum's character, Ian Malcolm, opening his mouth, yawning, 
and it becomes a visual gag, but then it becomes also a bridge to connect the two scenes. So do a Google search of Jurassic Park um, and uh, Jeff Goldblum's introduction and just watch the first five minutes and you'll get that scene. Now, we also have the motivation of time. Sometimes an editing choice comes from the overall pace of the motion picture combined with the rhythm of the scene. This can help energize a sequence or create uh, a type of mediation or, you know, like um, uh, show us that there's something happening. Um, if we do it quickly, this adds tension or disorientation, like boom, 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 boom. Um, we saw that especially in, um, I, I want to say that that was the technique that was used in uh, the movie about Queen. Um, I think it's called, oh, Bohemian Rhapsody when the whole band is sitting there and they're meeting um, one of the uh, agents for the first time and the cuts just boom, 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 they happen like fast. I personally think that was edited poorly. However, the film received an Academy Award for best editing. I don't think editors really were involved in that choice because that was bad, it was bad editing. And I'm not the only one who thinks that, other editors as well. But it's an example that we can use in terms of how to create tension or disorientation. I don't know if that's what they were trying to do. We usually see that in like uh, scenes of great stress or maybe, you know, like, oh, there's a meteor coming, cut, cut, cut. You see all the actors, you know, having their moment. We're like, it's coming, it's bigger than Texas, you know, whatever. And again, used to create tension. Longer cuts are meditative and um, can be elliptical, which means moving forward in time. So longer cuts, sometimes we have time lapses, right, of like, of, of, of uh, you know, the skies and clouds. Um, again, it's also used to slow something down. The pacing can be like a ride though, remember. Um, overall, sometimes it can be fast, sometimes it can be slow. So boom, 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 boom. Um, and uh, um, I think some of the, think about the action scenes in like Mission Impossible movies, um, especially when things are getting more intense or stressful or time's running, you're gonna notice the cuts get shorter. But when there's exposition or we're learning the story, the cuts get longer, get longer. Again, the standard in, in, any mo in most shows. Now we also have something called uh, shot composition. Um, some shots are designed to be long show pieces. As an example, uh, when we see the, the film, The Wizard of Oz, you've seen it. If not, just watch those scenes when Dorothy uh, first lands in, in Oz um, and is surrounded by the characters called Munchkins. We get a shot where she comes out, then we have color for the first time, and we get these beautiful crane shots. Notice there's not a lot of cutting, but we see the yellow brick road and it opens up and it sort of reveals itself. And we go from like medium close-up shots to master shots all in one take. Yes, that can be used and it can be used very, very effectively. And again, this is sometimes the editor will choose not to cut, but let it play out because we want to see that. And that sort of connection helps us understand like, whoa, it helps us give us that moment of like, whoa, like uh, uh, because of just cutting to show us the big road, it will lose its effectiveness because uh, the, the, the shot connects us from the medium to the master and kind of it reveals itself in a way, the way that uh, if we were in the position of Dorothy, we would kind of move our heads up and like, ah, experience it. Now we can also use dialogue scenes to match eye lines um, or using dialogue scenes, excuse me, uh, to match eye lines are a way to practice composition as well as tempo. So tempo. Some editors uh, like to use um, those um, sound recording or sound teaching devices. Um, the, um, I forgot what they're called. <laughs> they go metronome, excuse me. Yeah, metronomes, they go back and forth. Some, some people play those and like to use that. And, and it can be okay, but I, I personally don't because sometimes, um, you know, editing, it's its own thing. It does, I don't really believe in that kind of rhythm because I think if you follow that too closely, well, I know, uh, and it's been proven, your audience members will fall asleep, which is why many of us aren't too impressed with a lot of YouTube editors because they kind of just like to edit on the beat. And it makes it less interesting because the audience members are expecting cuts. And when you're expecting it, you get lulled. And when you get lulled into something, you get bored and then you switch off. This is why we don't always edit on the beat. We sometimes we switch it up to keep your audience engaged. 
Um, what we do is we match the edits with eye lines when cutting between left and right actors. But that's what we're doing. I mean, and this is just a further explanation of why. Um, and also, as a way to think about it this way, we're reemphasizing that 180 degree rule right here too. Left side, right side, matching eye line, matching eye line. Camera angle. This is also an explanation of the 30 degree rule. There has to be a reasonable difference in, one ca in a camera angle on action so that you can create a comfortable edit so it doesn't, again, appear like a jump cut and it looks like a sloppy YouTube editor. Um, now, typically, the editor will tend to cover dialogue scenes using the master scene method, the one that we explained earlier. Master, medium, close-ups, ending on the mediums. If there is not enough difference, though, uh, again, the audience will think there's a jump cut that may not be appropriate for that story itself. So here are examples that we can have of when we change the angle enough so that it looks different so that we don't think that there's a jump cut or like an error. And we could go left to right. See here, if we cut from this to, if we cut from the first two up top, where it looks like it's just a slight angle, then it might look like, well, it could be the same shot, but we won't, again, that's within that 30 degree rule. Instead, we wanna to go to the bottom two and do a cut. And what, what we also have here is the cinematographer um, between the first two on the top, they kept it also at one of those medium close-ups. So we're looking at a bus shot, right? Cause it's from the chest up. Instead, the editor chose to cut from the bus shot to the medium close-up where we get the flank shot or the hips. And that's different enough so that your audience will look, oh yeah, that's a different scene. We see that a lot in multi-camera shots or multi-angle shots. Um, this is a, definitely one of my favorite types of angles to use whenever I'm doing my setups. But this is what we prefer, the bottom two. Now, continuity. Continuity is about seamless transitions. Smooth, seamless transitions. Sometimes the jump cuts are necessary. It all depends on the story being told. The, the general rule of thumb that we want to think about in cinema uh, has been that the editor doesn't want to call attention or make the edit, edits obvious because we don't want to bring attention to edits. We don't want to call attention to ourselves. Again, this is why we want to make sure those edits and the jump cuts don't happen. So continuity of content. The actor's actions should match from one shot to the next and should overlap smoothly. A really, really great one. Um, well, let, let's say if, if uh, um, the action, let's say a hand going, to, if your hand goes like this and I'm moving right to left, the next cut should be my hand going for something, right? So I could, I could go, if I'm moving this way, like, oh, da, da, if, especially, maybe I'm even at an angle going left to right this way, the next cut could be this way, going into, but I'm uh, going, it's much closer, but I'm going into my object, but I'm still moving right to left. So direction is very important. Continuity of movement, Mo movement, actors moving in a certain direction. This should be consistent from shot to shot. An insert can be used to cover any misdirection. Again, that's the cutaway I mentioned so the audience can recalibrate the experience. So this way, if we flip our, our angle of action, then it won't be confusing if, as long as we know that we've cut away to something else. Again, that reestablishes. A really, really good way, um, or let's talk about continuity position. The actors and objects in the mise-en-scene, especially if we're cutting within, um, let's say the same shots, um, they should all be consistent. So if you if you have your Captain America, your Thor, and your Iron Man, and we're cutting around, and if they're left, middle, right, the same character should be left, middle, right, especially if we're cutting in dialogue scenes or they're talking to someone off screen. Um, even if we do provide that extra cutaway, we don't want to change it up too much because really, if we if we establish a layout of the room, we want to maintain that layout of the room. If our intent is to to create a sense of um, disorientation though, then okay, we can change them around. But that's usually only for like a horror movie, suspense, thriller, or uh, an experimental movie that's meant to do that. Um, but uh, good, good things to think about too. Um, a really nice one that uses a lot of this type of cutting on movement and action is uh, the introduction of Morpheus in the first Matrix movie. Uh, that's a great Google search to do. Look up that cut, and that's a, also a really great 
uh, technique called cutting on action, which was pioneered by Kurosawa and used extensively in the film Seven Samurai. But that cutting of action is great because it's a scene where Neo is introduced to Morpheus. We see Morpheus in the distance. And then as we see him turn around, we cut on action and we cut right into a close up of him. Really beautifully done, beautifully done. To me, one of the best introductions of cinema. Um, and, and you get a sense that this person is important with um, emphasized via the lightning strikes and the sound. And many people don't even notice that there's a boom, a quick jump cut into that, uh, to him as a close up. It's so well done, so well done. But that's a very excellent example of this continuity. Um, the last point that we're talking about today is sound. Uh, and again, with uh, editing, the sound should be consistent from one shot to the next if they have similar mise en scene. Um, so stuff like ambient sound of traffic, crowds, uh, again, all that murmuring, we want to make sure that that stays consistent. Also, the quality of the sound from the actors and objects should be consistent. They should all be at the same level and should pan constantly. Um, so if, like, if we're all in an action scene, then all the volume should be the same. It shouldn't go up or down. Again, this is an, another, this is more a, a technique uh, in regards to showing competency uh, because uh, it's another way that we can tell when uh, we're dealing with a new editor or novice editor because their sound volumes and uh, the quality will be all over the place. Um, uh, ambience and atmosphere and natural sound or the nats so that remember we talked about importance of recording it recording our natural environment so we can use that as sort of our underlying audio uh, to, to create a sense of consistent environment. The bed of consistent audio tone, which the dialogue and other sound effects are placed over, remember that's very important because that enhances the reality of the environment. Um, now, um, audio sometimes, this audio, remember, is generated in post, or it's finalized in post, but it's, it can be generated during production when we're filming. Uh, so this comes from the production audio recordings, again, the room tone, and is mixed in or created with other sounds by a sound designer later on in post. Um, remember, this ambience adds mood or feeling and can be mixed later into the final soundtrack. Throughout all of this, remember that all edits should be at the service of the story being told, and it should always be consistent. Now, sometimes we play with that sound or that audio to match what's happening on screen. And we change the levels. One of the best examples of this is in the movie Saving Private Ryan. When uh, at the beginning of the, of the film or the show, when uh, Tom Hanks character is experiencing the storming or that uh, Normandy and we have, we're thrust in the middle of it, notice then that there are a couple of things that happen that help disorient the viewer. A really great example is when uh, Tom Hanks' character um, uh, he's going, he's going across the beach, an explosion goes off and then all the volume goes down and we get this sort of high pitched sound, right? This tone beep, like a beep, right? It's like when something is uh, buzzing in your ear and it's also reinforced by the shutter, the slow shutter of the cinematographer. Things get very blurry, right? It becomes a little slow motion-y. And then the audio levels get echoey and piercy and cloudy. Again, all designed to bring our audience closer to our main character to experience what he's experiencing and to help understand this is what a shell-shocked soldier would, would be going through at this point in time. Very, very well done. We see that a couple times throughout the film, uh, especially at the climax with Tom Hanks' character. Remember when he gets shell-shocked and he's looking at the tank that's coming at him. But uh, those would be examples of how the audio can be changed to match um, the, uh, or at the service of the story to fit that final point, okay? So there's a lot that can go into editing. And notice we talked about a couple, the things that we talked about in terms of uh, being consistent are um, for both to be a um, competent editor and also an aspect of best practice. So it's a combination of those things. So keep all of this in mind. Uh, when you're thinking about the, the choice, uh, your choices for whether you're going to cut or not, um, how to use your levels in your audio, and how to use your shots also uh, that you're provided 
uh, from your cinematographer, from production, and even from your assistant editor. Okay, so that's chapters three through five in uh, grammar of the edits. And um, break a leg, everyone. <laughs>